Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you like to work for Jesus? What do you think? You got pretty good rights under him as your boss, your leader? <clears throat> there was a lot of people at the time of Jesus that thought he would be a pretty wonderful leader, rabbi, teacher, friend, boss. But when they came to him, a lot of, of those willing, excited individuals either turned away themselves because they didn't like what they saw or heard or what they got, or Jesus turned them away by refusing their application. We're going to see a little bit of that today, and we're going to see if, if we really do like having Jesus as our foreman, as our landowner, as our Savior. Just before the Gospel text that we read this morning, there was a man who had come to Jesus, a young, rich man, and he came to Jesus with his resume. And he said, hey Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit the kingdom? So what, what do I have to do to get in? And Jesus responded, well, keep the law. All of it, you know it, right? He said, yeah, of course I know it. And I've kept all of it. Jesus says, great. You're doing really good in this interview so far. Now I just need you to do one more thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You've got to be kidding me, Jesus. With his head down, he walks away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus pinpointed that security blanket, that thing holding him back from serving Jesus completely and really truly believing and trusting in him. <coughs> And that young man walked away and didn't enter into the kingdom of God. Now the disciples were there and they heard all of this happening. And they heard what Jesus told him of what you needed to get into heaven. You need to sell everything you have and follow Jesus and, and that'll do it. That'll get us into the kingdom of God. That'll make us worthy workers for Jesus. And so they say to Jesus... Lord, we've done that. We've left our, our profession as fishermen. We've left our homes. We've left our families. We've left all of this. So, Jesus, we should have a high, prominent place in your kingdom. Right? We've done exactly what you just told that rich young man to do. And Jesus acknowledges and says, because he knows much more of what these apostles are going to be, go through in the years ahead, that they have no idea is coming. But he knows that they're going to suffer for him, that they will believe that he has done everything for them, that they will found the church, and that, yes, they will come into the kingdom of God. And so he says, yes, you will hold 12 seats of honor over the 12 tribes of Israel in my kingdom. But then Jesus tells them, this parable. What did the disciples think they had and what they deserved? Well, they had given up so much, right? They had given up their lives. And Jesus had said, follow them. And they did. They left everything. And they invested in Him. They were His workers from day one. And they would continue to be. So... They deserve to be in the kingdom of heaven. That's what they thought, and that's, that's what they felt. And that attitude was dangerous. And so Jesus starts with this paradox. The last will be first, and the first last. Now, what does that mean? If you had an employer, and he, and he drew up a contract, you'd be like, this is what you can expect. These are your hours. This is your pay. This is what's going on. And then the small print on the bottom, it says, but the first will be last and the last will be first. That might make you a little nervous. Jesus starts with that, and then he says this parable, and then he ends with it again at the end of the parable. Let's read that parable again. I want you to think about working for Jesus and what it looks like. And if you think it's fair, 
if you think Jesus gives you your rights as a worker. Indeed, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing to pay the workers a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. He also went about the third hour and saw others standing unemployed in the marketplace. To these he said, you also go into the vineyard, and I will give you whatever is right. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And when he went out about the eleventh hour, he found others standing unemployed. And he said to them, why have you stood here all day unemployed? And they said to him, because no one hired us. So he told them, you also go into the vineyard. And when it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with the last group and ending with the first. And when those who were hired around the eleventh hour came, they each received a denarius. And when those who were hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but they each received a denarius too. After they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were last worked one hour, and you made them equal to us who have endured the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not make an agreement with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. I want to give the last one hired the same as I gave to you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? In this same way, the last will be first and the first last. So what do you think? Is Jesus a employer you would like to work for? <coughs> Might be frustrating. <laughs> if, you're, if you're the one who came first. You worked all day, and you get to the end of the work day, and someone came in the last hour, and they get the same amount of pay as you. Are you kidding me? All of that work you're not going to compensate me for? How is that fair? Jesus, if I've put in all this sweat, all of these tears, all of this time, and you give the exact same to the one who came in right at the end, in the last minute, because he must have been lazy or hiding so that he knew you would come later so he wouldn't have to do as much work, and you give him the same. You'd probably tell Jesus he's not a very good modern-day businessman. Because if your employer did that, at your job, you probably wouldn't work there very long, would you? Probably not. Because very quickly, you would feel that your work is not appreciated, you're not awarded what you are worth or what you are due for all the hard work you did. Maybe if you're the one who likes coming in the last hour, you would like him a lot. Because he paid you the same. So why the wisest man who ever lived, God himself, who knows what God the Father knows, Jesus, who is the ruler of heaven and earth, why does he have business practices that you wouldn't want to work for? What is going on? What is Jesus trying to teach us and the disciples and that young rich man about his kingdom? What is he trying to find or root out that we need to recognize about ourselves and the disciples needed to understand about themselves and what we need to understand about the kingdom of God. Let's make sure we understand all the key players here. So the vineyard, God is talking about, Jesus is talking about, is the kingdom work of God. Okay, so that is essentially the work that the church has been called to do. This is God's saving activity in this world. So that means this vineyard is for you. And you are working in it right now. You have been called by Jesus to follow Him. You have been made His children, God's children. How? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. What did you bring as your resume to be a worker in God's kingdom? Being someone who would carry the good news of Jesus to the world. What did you bring? Well, a long list of lost jobs and missed appointments and getting to work late, if ever, 
and failing the people around you, your references can't even reference or give you any good credit. It, if anything, they'll show just as much as how bad you are at keeping your commitments and promises. And Long story short, your resume doesn't look very good. And yet God called you. Why? Because Jesus paid this enormous price to wipe away that credit history and that resume that didn't look so good. And instead, he gave his father his resume. And what did that resume look like? Perfect. Always there on time. Always does exactly what I say. He's the best worker. He does everything the most efficiently. He never cheats. He never does anything wrong. And above and beyond, he has donated himself so that all of you look wonderful and perfect and have his righteousness. So now, yeah, you had a beautiful resume when you came in, but it wasn't yours. It was the landowner's. Jesus. He has called you to work in his vineyard because he saved you. He loves you. All right, so now that we understand that, and we're the workers, and Jesus is our landowner, and the field is the kingdom of God, which is the gospel being preached, and we're a part of this, why are we so mad that we are getting paid less, or it feels like less, than those who came in at the end. Here at Denarius, it's the amount of money for a day's, it's a day's wages. So it's not a huge amount of money that they agreed upon at the beginning, the workers. But it's exactly what they need, right? And it's exactly what God promised to give them. Now, a denarius doesn't sound like very much, but think about if Jesus is saying, I will reward you for the time you spend in my kingdom sharing the gospel with other people. Oh yeah, by the way, you are in this kingdom, which means you will inherit eternal life. What more do we need? And as the master says at the end, he says, friend, am I doing you any wrong? Is Jesus doing you any wrong? If you've been a Christian your whole life and someone comes in right before they die, they confess their sins, someone who's been evil and killed people and, and the worst terrible sins that you can imagine, but at the end of their life, they turn to the Lord and ask Him for forgiveness and He says, okay, you got the job. You're in my kingdom. You get to be a part of this for one hour. Does that upset you? Does that bother you? And Jesus says to you, have I done you any wrong? Because I am gracious. Because I love that person too. We see this playing out in our first lesson for today with Jonah. This is in the Old Testament and Jonah was sent to this evil, wicked city called Nineveh. It was the capital city of, the, of a terrible empire that was oppressing the Jews. And God sends him to the enemy. And he doesn't want to go, and you know the story of Jonah. He runs away. He goes the opposite direction on a boat. And what does God do? He sends a storm that is going to kill everybody on the boat. And Jonah says, all right, it's my fault. I really made God angry. You should probably throw me off the boat. And so they do, and the storm goes away. And Jonah sinks down, but God doesn't let him die. He brings a giant fish that swallows him, brings him to the shore, dumps him out. And then he says to him again, Now, Jonah, are you going to go to Nineveh this time? <laughs> and he does. And he goes there and he preaches the word of God and says, Unless you repent, you will all die. And they do. This wicked city that didn't know God at all, they hear the message, the word of God, and they believe. And they repent. They put on sackcloth and they beg for God's mercy. And Jonah's sitting up in the hillside just waiting for the fireworks. He's waiting for God to rain down fire on this evil people that he hates. He despises them. And nothing happens. Because God has relented, because they listened. And they turned to God for mercy and they found it. 
And he gets so angry. And he's angry about the sun burning his head so much that he wishes he could die. God is just showing us the ridiculousness of our own thinking sometimes. And he says to them, should I not be concerned for 120,000 people that I formed in the womb, that I love, that I care about? Should I not be concerned for this great city and its people? Do you ever feel that way, like Jonah, though? Where there's others you think about and you really don't want them to be in your church. You don't think they deserve it, like you do, maybe. You've put in the man hours, you've been working, you've been preaching, you've been telling others about Jesus, and you feel you should have at least some status in this kingdom. That's exactly what the disciples saw. They said, Lord, we should have a place of honor in your kingdom, right? Because we gave up everything to follow you. And Jesus, probably with a little smirk on his face, said, you don't even know what's coming <laughs> to be in my kingdom. But you're right, you will have a place of honor. But the last will be first and the first will be last. This is your worker's right. You have a right to be in my kingdom. Why? Because I died for you. You have a right to be a part of this beautiful ministry of sharing the good news that I have come to die for the world and I will rise again on the third day. And that is the same thing that's true of you when you will die, that you will rise and you will be in the eternal kingdom with God. That is your privilege to know and believe and have as a comfort and hope your entire life. Why? Because I died for you, disciples, members, Christians. Jesus' point with this parable is to root out our arrogance and our feeling that we deserve something for the work we do for God. Jesus' point with telling this parable is to get rid of that. He's very good at turning the tables on us. Because we quickly be like, oh, I'm such a good Christian. I deserve to be here. And Jesus says, that's exactly the attitude that will get you kicked out the last hour. This is what you need to remember. You are here, a part of my church, a part of my people, because I love you and have died for you. Don't ever stop thinking of this beautiful job that I have given you to be a part of my work of saving other people as a job think of it as a privilege you are a beautiful part of my ministry of my work here we are today St. Paul and all of you who are gathered here today we are a part of the mission of sharing Jesus and his mercy and his love with the people around you but we don't do that because we're going to get something for it we do it because Jesus has given us so much already. He has freed us from this world, so we don't have to be afraid of the hurricanes. We don't have to be afraid of the mass shooters in Vegas. We don't have to be afraid of anything. But why? Because we are so powerful? No, because we are a part of the kingdom where the landowner is Jesus Christ. And He has given us power over death, sin, and the devil. So let us with excitement and joy work in God's kingdom as long as He asks us to do it because we know whatever sufferings we go through, we get to do it for Jesus who has died for us and has called us to be in His kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Please rise.